Um, okay, uh, well, I will uh, kick off by introducing myself. Um, my name is George Evans and I'm Editorial Officer at the Europeana Foundation. Um, and uh, thank you so much for having me to today together with Killian Downing to talk about a new professionals task force um, that we ran as part of this and uh, hopefully uh, explain why it's relevant um, to everyone watching as well. Killian. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Killian Downing. I am an archivist in Dublin City University Library and I'm also a voluntary counsellor for the Europeana Network Association. So uh, yeah, we're delighted to be here today and, and following on from the, the round table there. It's great uh, to have the opportunity uh, to kind of talk about some of the work that we're doing and some of the work that we want to continue to do uh, with uh, no time to wait and then this wonderful community. So uh, yeah, so we have uh, a quick um, guide to what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk very briefly about Europeana. Uh, I think uh, most uh, people here will have heard about it, know kind of what it, what it does, but we'll uh, look into that uh, with a, a little kind of detail for anyone who might not know. Uh, we're going to chat about the Network Association and then talk about the uh, New Professionals Task Force and what we were, we were hoping uh, to achieve uh, when we uh, went about that work uh, kind of last year and then we really want to kind of open the floor uh, to everyone here uh, we have a kind of a mentimeter prepared uh, just to get some kind of thoughts and get some consensus and and then we're we'd be very happy to kind of uh, think about you know i suppose as, as dave rice said community uh, consensus around kind of best practice so um, uh, thanks, uh, Georgia. Uh, so yeah, so uh, Europeana. Uh, so this is a big strong statement about uh, Europeana's mission, and and really, um, it's uh, it's a platform um, for digital cultural heritage, and uh, it publishes millions of digital objects. Uh, from I think at the moment it's around three three and a half thousand. Uh, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, um, kind of, and, and cultural memory organizations. So there's a lot of different types of kind of individuals and uh, organizations and associations who work with uh, Europeana. And, and really it's all about um, kind of sharing uh, uh, open, uh, openly licensed um, cultural heritage uh, where possible and kind of reacting uh, to uh, the cultural heritage community. And, um, if uh, we just go to the next slide, thanks, George. Yeah. Um, Sorry, there you go. So, oh, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> so, um, uh, so who are we? Yeah. So this is just a kind of um, a big picture uh, idea about the European Initiative. So the um, the platform operator is the foundation itself. So that's kind of the organisation that's based in the Hague. It's about 60 uh, people, uh, one of which is Georgia, and I think it's about 20, 20, uh, 20 kind of uh, um, countries of, of where the people who work there are from. Uh, there is the Aggregators Forum, and they work with Europeana uh, to publish uh, material to Europeana and basically create the content. Um, and then there is the Network Association. So this is for basically individual members who might, uh, I don't know, be finishing kind of a college or university, or they might be changing career and they want to get involved in kind of digital cultural heritage. And so uh, like uh, No Time to Wait, uh, the Network Association is free for anyone to join and to get involved uh, in. So. Thank you so much, Killian. Um, so yeah, just quickly to kind of say what this what this means in practice. And as Killian kind of said, I'm sure this will be familiar to some people watching, but in case it's not, it's good to give an overview, I hope. Um, so what this translates to is cultural heritage institutions throughout Europe sharing their cultural heritage online and making it available through Europeana, which they do through a network of aggregators, the aggregators form, as Killian said. Um, this could then all be explored on the Europeana website, which you can see a nice little screenshot of here. Um, so it helps, uh, it allows people to search and browse over 50 million records, discover stories from Europe's cultural heritage, um, and also discover new and untold stories, which are told through kind of um, editorial, like uh, that brings content together, blogs, exhibitions, galleries. Um, and there's also educational content for people working um, in schools or maybe in museums in education to discover to bring cultural heritage as well. Um, each item on the Europeana website is um, attributed, it has a link back to the data providers website, so for example a museum um, has provided it, you can get back to the object on their website, um, it has clear information about how it can be reused and catalogue information from the source. 
Um, the other side, I guess, of what Europeana does is also about empowering digital change in the cultural heritage sector and supporting cultural heritage institutions to be able to do that. And on the screenshot on the um, screen, you can see a screenshot of our website for professionals, which does that. Um, this is a lot more about um, network and community activities, about developing services and tools and also frameworks which support cultural heritage professionals, projects and partnerships, which kind of still serve to support digital transformation um, and also kind of uh, organizing events for the sector and um, sharing news that's of, um, of interest and relevance. Um, so that's just a very broad and quick overview, but what we want to focus in on next, and I'll hand back to Killian, is um, the Europeana Network Association. Uh, thanks, Georgia. So, uh, yes, so um, something I'd recommend for any attendees here not already involved in is to uh, sign up and join uh, the Network Association, and you can get kind of involved uh, in it, uh, depending on, on your kind of time and, and kind of... Um, uh, context in that uh, it's basically a, a community of kind of members who uh, come from all backgrounds and kind of walks of life all over the world and um, from that uh, there are kind of uh, seven communities and uh, a brand new community this year was a, a kind of a climate action community where um, thanks Georgia uh, spot on so uh, a climate action community uh, focused on kind of bringing um, individuals and kind of organizations together to kind of um, uh, make a position, make a stand about kind of uh, climate justice and that. And so that was kind of a, a really uh, impressive step to take. And, and really that means that the community is resourced. And uh, while a lot of um, the European Network Association is kind of on a voluntary basis, uh, Europeana do provide um, uh, professionals then to kind of help us and kind of to to ac activate. So the other uh, communities are um, listed uh, on this slide here and very much uh, kind of the audio visual dimension of, of these communities uh, kind of interacts with with each of these. Um, I think uh, a big uh, a por a part of this, so the structure is that every uh, year or two there are elections whereby uh, councillors are uh, elected by uh, the 3,500 members and they um, will ba basically um, work uh, for a, uh, two to three years uh, through uh, their communities and then through a management board, basically, which works with the Europeana Foundation and responds to kind of uh, issues and, and kind of uh, developments that Europeana wants to take. And the, the Network Association, I, I suppose, feeds into the strategy and the agenda and basically this year and, and since, oh, well, it's been a couple of years now, for example, like the uh, kind of climate action has been a huge uh, a push uh, from the network uh, uh, from the network and Europeana has responded uh, on that. Uh, so um, I'm happy to uh, move on there, uh, Georgia. Thank you. So uh, from uh, each of the communities, um, individuals who are members of the network association can propose task force, and a task force could just be a, a response to. A, uh, an issue or a challenge or an observation where bringing people together, uh, there could be a kind of a solution to it. So listed here are just kind of three examples. Uh, one of them is going on at the moment and, and two others have kind of resulted in a, a white paper and kind of recommendations. But in terms of looking at uh, technical expertise and then kind of practical tools that can support kind of the dissemination of kind of audiovisual content uh, and kind of anything around kind of copyright and licensing. Uh, it's so important that there's kind of a common language and a consensus around it. So one of the task force uh, that uh, was uh, brought about uh, as a result of a, a kind of a conference in Lisbon was the new professional uh, task force. And um, yeah. George, I'll hand over to you if you want to introduce that. Yeah, lovely. Thanks so much, Killian. So uh, obviously the task forces on the slide before, I hope, uh, would think would kind of have uh, interest to the community and people we're presenting on. But we also want to tell you about this task force um, and why it also really has um, has relevance, I hope, for everyone working in, in kind of the cultural heritage sector broadly, more broadly. 
Um, so a task force that um, I got involved in, um, in my role at the Europeana Foundation in uh, kind of early 2020 and uh, with Killian was the new professionals task force. And um, we define new professionals meaning anyone who's been working in the sector for five years or less it's not something that's necessarily bound by age um, and i think that's really important and also really important because as we've heard earlier it could even kind of the challenges that might face this group could even apply to someone who's kind of changing career as well so i think it's really important to note that that's kind of where um where this um kind of term comes from um so first of all why were we interested in looking at kind of the challenges facing new professionals in the cultural heritage sector well first of all i think because there was kind of this understanding that there are challenges um and that face you know all professionals working in the cultural heritage sector but some particular ones that also face new professionals. Um, and I think, again, we've kind of um, touched on them even today, you know, kind of, uh, Kira mentioned, you know, low pay, limited advancement opportunities, which again, can apply to everyone, but often really hit people who are new to the sector. Um, and also kind of, even in the previous talk, we heard about kind of how, how fear and doubt obviously can affect everyone, but that actually, if you're new to the sector, it can be harder to kind of decide how to proceed with that or, um, or to read situations. So this kind of these particular challenges and this was something that we wanted to understand better with this task force um, and the reason we wanted to understand this better is um, to then understand how the Europeana Network Association which you know aims to um, represent um, new professionals um, and reflect the needs of new professionals out of throughout Europe could um, support them um, as well and um, ultimately the kind of aim for this is to make the European and Network Association more sustainable inclusive and diverse by bringing in new professionals um, new points of view and again really reflecting um, the the needs of the sector um, so who was involved in the task force? Um, obviously myself, um, I was involved um, as a member of the Europeana Foundation, but also because I am myself a new professional. Um, I started my career in the cultural heritage sector working at Europeana, um, and it was uh, really great to, to be involved from that perspective as well. Um, obviously Killian, um, who led the task force, and I understand has been raising this issue um, and kind of the challenges facing new professionals for, for much longer than the task force itself. So um, of course it was great to, to have him. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um, and then what was really fantastic is that we had people join it. Um, we had people join it, not just who were kind of familiar with the Europeana ecosystem and had worked with Europeana before, but people who were also new to Europeana. And again, that's what the task force was about, was bringing in new people and perspectives. Um, so that was really fantastic and something I really enjoyed and would also just echo that is something that all task forces have the capacity to do. If you're new to Europeana, they can be a really great way to get involved. So I would really encourage you, um, if you are thinking about joining Europeana or remember to think about getting involved as well. Um, I just also wanted to share this quotation from um, Carlota Marijuana Rodriguez, who at the time was Vice President of the, European, of the European Students Association for Cultural Heritage, who joined the task force, um, about the experience of joining the task force itself. Um, and I think this is a really nice way to show how even as we were doing research into the experience of new professionals, we were also um, kind of uh, giving experience to new professionals and bringing us together as well. Um, and that that was really satisfying to see this as kind of um, a networking opportunity as well. Um, I'll hand back to Killian to share a bit more about how we actually approach this. Uh, thanks, Georgia. So, um, yeah, completely. Um... Uh, agree with all of that and I think um, it's it's been a journey definitely that resulted in in the report and I'll just share uh, a link to it there uh, as I have it and um, the research uh, I suppose focused on um, a methodology where I think the first thing uh, was a kind of a recognition about our uh, backgrounds our privilege and and that really formed a key part of um, uh, recognizing that before we kind of went out about went out on our, our, our kind of research, and uh, really I suppose um, the root of the methodology uh, was kind of increasingly informed by intersectional feminism, and really uh, that uh, can be kind of. Um, uh, considered like in a number of ways in terms of uh, the kind of multi-dimensionality of, I suppose, uh, people's backgrounds and their experiences and their perspectives. And very much um, some of that is not um, um, kind of part of, of Europeana and part of the network. So we were really looking at kind of um, 
what the network uh, represented and what it wasn't rep representing. And as part of that, then uh, we had to ask some serious questions. So uh, the research uh, focused on kind of uh, collaboration, uh, of course, with uh, young and new professionals, uh, which we uh, talked to. And, uh, and there were, um, of course, uh, some uh, as part of the task force itself. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, apart from kind of literature, also looked at kind of existing um, organizations and associations who are working kind of in this area. So we were um, um, kind of actively working with um, the ESAC, the European Students uh, Association for Cultural Heritage, uh, which uh, Car Carlotta is the vice president of. And there was also the International Council and Archives who had a, no, a new professionals program and a very, uh, a very impressive kind of conference body system, and then a mentorship, uh, which was really kind of um, providing an opportunity for somebody maybe starting out their career to have somebody to talk to, perhaps if they were kind of especially finding a, uh, going through a difficult uh, moment and needed kind of advice that was kind of neutral and, and somebody, you know, that uh, could be kind of re relied upon an email away and that kind of thing. Uh, we also were working with uh, We Are Museums, uh, Alessandra, of course, of course, with No Time to Wait, uh, and then uh, the ICOM Comcall network. Um, and, and then we were also looking at uh, a young European Heritage Alliance uh, task force, uh, of course. So all of this kind of research uh, informed the work of the task force and, and the report. And basically, um, if you want to go to the next slide there, uh, Georgia, um, a lot of the methodology that we were using uh, was informed by uh, some Europeana resources, which included the Impact uh, Playbook, uh, which was kind of a way in which uh, organizations can kind of communicate and articulate perhaps the impact they want to see and map out on a kind of a, a pathway or, or a kind of a timeline, how to kind of uh, get towards that. So uh, what's on the slide in front of you now is I suppose the kind of the impact that we wanted to make uh, going as far as, you know, society itself and, uh, as, and the role that uh, cultural heritage plays within that. And then uh, short-term, long-term outcomes and, and really uh, understanding the needs and the challenges and the, and the the, you know, there's so many, and especially uh, we were kind of considering um, the, I think we kind of um, um, talked about it in terms of uh, different challenges. So there was kind of precarious unemployment, uh, jo job casualization, structural youth unemployment that's affecting kind of uh, Europe, especially and, and parts all over the world, and the effects of uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, which are, are, are still and going to be around for some time. Uh, I, I think, and then of course, uh, systemic uh, racism and discrimination, uh, which uh, exists in, in, in uh, Europeana and uh, the wider cultural sector as it exists in uh, society. So, uh, uh, George, if you want to fire to the next slide there. Um, so the report that we linked there is uh, a summary, uh, sorry, it has a summary of the recommendations in it. And, and these are uh, some of the key uh, recommendations that we sought to kind of implement uh, as a result of the task force. And this was kind of uh, looking to kind of change the way in which the European Network Association and the initiative itself. And as a result of these recommendations, um, uh, George, if you just want to uh, uh, highlight them now in the next slide, uh, these were kind of the six areas that we wanted to see change. And uh, there were sub kind of recommendations uh, I suppose actions under that in which uh, we gave um, responsibility to certain kind of um, substructures, let's say within the European initiative to carry them out and to consider uh, what resources will be need under what kind of time frame to, to kind of uh, uh, well to, to uh, deliver them. And for some of these recommendations, some have been uh, started and implemented, but there, there are many uh, that still need to be uh, kind of uh, pushed and kept on the agenda, but definitely in terms of uh, conferences and kind of events uh, that have uh, taken place with Europeana, uh, young and new professionals are on the agenda because it's kind of widely accepted now that they're not uh, actively part of, uh, you know, the U Europeana ecosystem or network, and we have evidence to prove that now that it's it's very much a, a kind of a network dominated by 
uh, I suppose, of certain countries uh, where the demographics um, are, are kind of saying that there needs to be more work to kind of listen and encourage new professionals into uh, Europeana. So, uh, um, Georgia, if you want to take it from there, I think. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Killian. And as Killian was already saying, so the recommendations that came through the task force are being um, worked through by different elements of the European initiative. And um, one of the recommendations actually was the uh, supporting the establishment of a membership working group of the European Network Association to explore these questions. Um, and that working group has been established, which is fantastic. So they're working through these. Um, obviously, uh, continued collaboration with um, organisations that we've mentioned, like ESAC, um, but also no, no Time to Wait was kind of identified as a specific uh, group that it would be great to keep talking to, keep collaborating with, and obviously that's why we're um, we're so happy to uh, to be here today as well. Um, as Killian said, continuing uh, to listen to and highlight new professionals is really important. And at Europeana's own conference, Europeana 2021, um, we ran a kind of lunch for new professionals to people who are new in the sector, who it might be their first um, conference uh, of Europeana, or it might be one of the first ones that they'd attended. And I think especially online now, it can be quite daunting to know um, kind of how to how to go and speak to people, how to strike up conversations. Um, and so we had a lunch and then we had a kind of space in our gather town at the conference as well that people could kind of drop into to have a chat and play some games. Um, and uh, I was really enjoying uh, the gather town um, for this conference as well and exploring it and uh, to see that there's different spaces where people can come together, I think is really important um, and really fantastic. Um, we're also um, looking forward to the European Year of Youth next year and uh, exploring what kind of possibilities there will be to include um, and work with new professionals as part of that as well. Um, and finally, I think uh, it's not explicitly said here, but uh, well, continuing to listen to is really important and to hear about the issues that people are having or things that they want to see represented is always really important. So we would really invite you to get in touch. Um, I've put my email address there um, and I um, can also share things with Killian as well and more widely in the initiative. So if you have any questions, um, please do get in touch with me and I'd be happy to try and help. Um, and just while I'm on that, I've um, actually seen a question in the chat from someone who's saying um, they're already a member of the tech and research communities. Um, how can they become a member of um, task forces? And when those different communities are organizing task forces, um, they should be publicizing them through kind of the newsletter, through social media as well. And that should kind of highlight that there's one coming up and when there's opportunities to get involved. So when they come up, um, it's a chance to apply. Um, you can also suggest ideas for task forces, Killian, I think I'm, I'm correct in that. So if there's also a topic that you're you're really keen to in, in um, explore that's also something um, a way into them as well. Um, so just quickly now, as we come to the end of uh, our presentation, we just wanted to leave a bit of time um, for questions and also to hear a bit more from the audience. Um, so we've uh, prepared a Mentimeter with some questions. Um, if you haven't used Menti before, it'll show you in a sec, but you either need your phone or to open another tab to go to menti.com and fill in a code and then you'll be able to, to take part in it. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, just to say um, that we'll just kind of use this information, it's just a useful insight, might give you some ideas if there's anything that you want to ask um, in the Q&A as well, um, or anything you want to discuss afterwards. So I will just move into Menti um, and give everyone a few minutes to get there. So um, you have to go to menti.com and put in this code at the top. Um, and I'll just wait for a few people to join. And there is the first question that you can see. Um, and when I say the cultural heritage sector in this question, so as a new professional, did you or do you feel supported starting work in the cultural heritage sector? Um, obviously, that can kind of encompass, you know, working in libraries, working in GLAMs, um, working in digital preservation, um, working with archival material. You know, it's really a term that I hope would encompass um, what many people here um, work in as well. We have seven responses so far and there's 85 people in the call so I'm going to leave it a little bit longer to, to let people try and get there and if you're having problems please um please say in the chat <laughs> slowly creeping up this is obviously just a very broad overview because uh, this is always the kind of thing it'd be great to be able to uh, to interrogate and find out why there's this difference but um it's it's kind of interesting to see now that there's actually a real balance between how people were feeling 
That's such an interesting, interesting question. You're right. Like, what does supported mean? Mm, yeah. And again, that's that's I think another question for a task force to answer is is support within your institution or is it within the sector more widely, um, which some of the other questions kind of um, touch on a bit as well. I'll just give one more minute. Uh, one thing the task force did look at was the uh, Europeana rules for reimbursement. So uh, Europeana would reimburse any individuals who wanted to go to a conference or the uh, annual general assembly or kind of training events that kind of cropped up during the year. And uh, it was kind of felt that because uh, the rules were restricted to one individual per institution, um, it was um, normally a kind of a senior uh, professional in the cultural heritage organization got to go. And then we were kind of looking at ways in which uh, we could make that more equitable uh, for definitely new professionals who perhaps didn't have maybe the autonomy or support, support structures in place to be able to kind of attend. And that's not just an issue for Europeana, but it's an, an, an issue kind of across the board. So. Mm. Yeah, uh, although I can see more people joining, I'm going to move on to the next question and then you can continue to join that as well. But interesting to see that it is it is uh, slightly more leaning towards yes, which is encouraging to see, but obviously kind of has this has this 50 50 split as well. Um, so um, this question is kind of a free text in how would you describe your experience of starting work in the cultural heritage sector and again in a kind of the widest sense of the term. Was it positive, negative? exciting daunting I don't, i'm just putting words in people's heads now but uh fear yeah <laughs> daunting lonely yeah That's, okay uh, Stephen, i think said it yeah aptly earlier yeah yeah imposter i mean i think this is this um just looking at this i think really sums up many of the things we identified in the task force this kind of you know difficult to get into the sector and know where to go to this imposter syndrome feeling frightened about what it is um under evaluated that's really interesting slow frustrating yeah um really great to see uh, one person saying positive and exciting that's fantastic as well and obviously these things can coexist as well um but i do think it is quite telling that they seem quite negative most of these Killian would you agree yeah well this is it I mean um, I, I remember even uh, let's say just on a personal perspective when I started my first job um, it was uh, during the last recession it, it started off really positive and then it went completely uh, to the opposite and uh, uh, and that can happen where you have this kind of mm. duality of, of this experience and it can change uh, in a matter of, of days or weeks sometimes Mm. Uh, so so it's 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 about kind of i suppose uh, knowing when to turn and knowing and recognizing that the support's there for for you uh, to to kind of reach out to mm. there's an interesting comment in the chat about someone who who read the question in another way that students kind of feel really supported and then kind of dropped after maybe they enter the sector and, and that's quite um interesting as well and i think speaks to the next question that i'm going to move on to hopefully yeah, so which is when you started working in the sector, did you know where you could access support and research sources? And again, going back to that comment, maybe if you're a student at university, it may be a bit clearer where to go if, if you've kind of had that support. And then I wonder if when you've entered the sector or again, obviously, this isn't bound by age if you've been working in a completely different sector and moved to cultural heritage. So it's all news to you. Do you know how where to go? Um, Interestingly and encouragingly, I think this is um, this is great to see here. It's more um, more on the yes side, and obviously this is a very small sample of the people who are in the virtual room. But great to see. Um, fantastic. Okay, and then finally, um, and in the interest of time, to go to our final question, um, and this is a big one: What do young, new, and emerging professionals in the cultural heritage sector need right now, either from your experience of currently being? A young new or emerging professional or from your memory of what it was to be one um and uh yeah mm. cash money baby yep low pay, pay an letter, issue definitely. yeah and uh, a lot of the the uh, new the task force report was about uh, the exploitation that happens especially a kind of internship level 
uh, where uh, individuals are put under immense uh, pressure and and exploited and, and bullied in, in kind of the negative consequences. But then equally, uh, some do have incredibly positive experiences and that kind of sets and inspires people to kind of go off in a career. Mm. But like there is such a kind of uh, a, a kind of variance in, within that, you know, and, and what we were trying to explore. And, and I guess this is why we're here doing this presentation because we want to carry on this work and and kind of welcome the, the nuance and, and the complexity and uh, to this. Yeah, yeah, I would agree and just um, kind of keep this conversation going and, and to kind of in as many places we can raise the topic as well, um, because hopefully if we will have a better understanding of it, we can also all understand how to better um, support new professionals as well. Um, so conscious of time, thank you everyone who shared your thoughts here, we will um, be keeping this, um, obviously it's, it's an honest, we don't know who's written it, but it's great to see that overview. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for having us and uh, yeah it's been a it's been a pleasure to speak to you thank you thank you so much if you have time to answer a brief question in the chat um, someone was asking if you found anything um, any anything involving like uh, class ceilings or advancement for new professionals um, specifically from underrepresented groups mm -hmm. um, the the Question asker uh, yeah. acknowledges, and I agree. I've seen a lot more diversity at the younger emerging professionals, and then less and less as you go on. Like, I don't. They maybe have to switch jobs or, or do something else for various reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was covered. Yeah, Killian, would you like? Do you want to, to start with it? Um, oh, well, this, it, it, I mean, it's 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 a complete truth, and um, I think um, one of the key issues that we were only, I suppose, scratching the surface on was the lack of, uh, for example, uh, equality data, and and having access to that, and then in terms of uh, organisations themselves uh, collecting and coll collating it, but then. Equally, it's so necessary that that um, data is kind of published in a in a way that it's anonymized, of course, uh, for uh, to protect anyone, but uh, and and protect any people kind of sh sharing it. But uh, we need uh, more uh, uh, kind of uh, quality da data as evidence to prove, uh, you know, what we think notionally in terms of imbalances, uh, discrimination, and and uh, systemic uh, discrimination in this in the sector. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I would just add quickly, I don't, I don't know if we could answer if we could answer kind of that specific question. But I think as, as Killian said, it was a lot about recognizing that we we maybe don't know and that the data isn't there to, to find it. But um, I think uh, I think it's a really, uh, of course, a really valid point as well. Great. Thank you both so much. This is such a fantastic talk.